Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, once again we come into your presence with humble hearts, with the spirit of learners, wanting to hear your voice speaking to us. Our thoughts can never reach the height of your thoughts. And therefore, we implore divine wisdom. We ask, Lord, that you will give us tender hearts to receive the message that you have for us today. And we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. In our topic today, we're going to study about the number of the beast. And I'd like to begin by reading a text that we find in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 1. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 1. This is the passage that begins the description of the sea beast, which we have already identified as the Roman Catholic papacy, not individuals within the system. We're talking about a system. We're talking about an organization. And we've already clearly identified from the Bible that this beast that rises from the sea represents the Roman Catholic papacy. It says there in Revelation 13 verse 1, speaking about this beast, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. So as we begin our study, we want to notice that the name of the beast is a blasphemous name. And the blasphemous name is found on the beast's heads. Now in order to understand what this blasphemous name is, we must first of all understand the biblical definition of blasphemy. Do we have a clear definition of the Bible, in the Bible, of what blasphemy consists of? The answer this, to this question is absolutely yes. In the Bible, blasphemy is when a mere man claims to be God, and when a mere man claims to have the power to perform the works of God. And we're going to take a look at several instances in Scripture where blasphemy is described in this manner. Once again, blasphemy in the Bible means a man, a mere man who claims to be God, and secondly, that mere man claims to be able to perform the works of God and exercise in his actions the power of God. One time Jesus said something very controversial. It's found in John chapter 10 and verse 30. This is what he said to the Jews that were listening to him. I and my Father are one. And we're told in the context that the Jews immediately picked up stones to cast at Jesus. Because you see, Leviticus 24 verse 16 clearly said, and they knew this, that whoever claimed to be one with the Father in the sense that Jesus was saying it was claiming to be God. And the Levitical law said that whoever claimed to be God needed to be stoned. And so when they picked up stones, Jesus asked them a question. He said, why do you want to stone me? What evil work have I done that justifies you stoning me? And notice what their response was in John chapter 10 and verse 33. John 10 verse 33. For a good work we do not stone you, but for what? But for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself God. What is blasphemy? It's when a mere man claims to be what? God. Now, Jesus was God. He had a right to claim to be God. But according to them, blasphemy is when a mere man claims to be God. Also blasphemy is when someone claims to be able to perform the works of God. Immediately after uh, Jesus said, I and my Father are one, Jesus claimed also to perform the works of his Father. Notice John chapter 10 and verses 36 to 39. John 10, 36 to 39. 
Jesus says, Do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Therefore they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. So notice the, the definition that Scripture gives of blasphemy is when a mere man claims to be God and claims to perform the works of God or manifest in his actions the power of God. Now it's interesting to notice also that the Jews accused Jesus of blasphemy because he claimed to be the Son of God. Now, all of the Jews believed that they were sons of God in a general sense of the word. But they knew that when Jesus was saying that he was the Son of God, what he was meaning is that he was the representative of God on earth, that he was the authorized spokesman for God if you please, Jesus was claiming to be the vicar of God, or vicarius Dei, the representative of God on earth. Now it's interesting to notice also that blasphemy is defi defined in Scripture as when a mere man claims to have the power to forgive sins. Not only when a mere man claims to be God, but also when he claims to exercise the power and prerogatives of God. Notice Mark chapter 2 and verse 7. Jesus meets a paralytic, and he says to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven. By the way, this took place in the city of Capernaum. And the Jews immediately, when Jesus said, Your sins are forgiven, they thought in their hearts, according to Mark 2 verse 7, Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? You see, they were thinking, if this man forgives sins, and only God can forgive sins, this man is claiming to be God. So blasphemy is when a man claims to be God, and claims to be able to perform the functions and the prerogatives of God. Notice 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verses 3 and 4. This is another passage that is speaking about the Antichrist. By the way, the man of sin in 2 Thessalonians 2 is the same as the beast from the sea, is the same as the little horn, is the same of the, as the abomination of desolation, and the same as the harlot of Revelation chapter 17. In other words, these are different symbols that point to the same power. The man of sin is the same as the little horn, the same as the beast. Notice 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 and 4, what the Antichrist does. It says there, Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day, which is the coming of Christ, that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. A better translation is the apostasy. In Greek it says apostasia. So it be translated, it should be translated, that day will not come until the apostasy comes first and the man of sin is revealed. So is this a mere man that is revealed? Yes, it's a mere man, right? The man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. What is one of the main characteristics of the Antichrist? He sits in the temple of God and he claims to be what? He claims to be God. And by the way, what is the temple of God? The temple of God is not the Jewish temple which supposedly is going to be rebuilt in the Middle East. The temple of God, according to every other passage in the writings of the Apostle Paul, represents the Christian church. Now, I want you to notice also that this Antichrist of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 not only claims to be God, but he also claims to have the power of God to exercise the power of God. Notice in the same passage, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 9. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 9. Speaking about this same individual who sits in the temple of God, showing himself to be God, it says there, 
the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all what? Power, signs, and lying wonders. Let me ask you, is this Antichrist only going to claim to be God, or is he going to apparently do the works, the powerful works of God? Evidently he's also performing the works of God, although he is a mere man. He's the man of sin. By the way, the only other time in the New Testament where th these three words appear together in one verse, power, signs, and wonders, is in Acts chapter 2 and verse 22. I want to read that verse because I'm going to show you that what the Antichrist is going to do is falsify the works that Jesus performed while he was on this earth. Notice Acts 2 and verse 22. Men of Israel, this is Peter speaking, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst as you yourselves also know. Did Jesus perform the power and the acts of God? He most certainly did. Is the Antichrist going to perform works that appear to be the works of God? Absolutely, because he claims to be what? God. But these aren't the only passages that describe blasphemy. You remember that little horn of Daniel chapter 7. We read verse 25. And one of the characteristics of the little horn is that this horn speaks pompous words against the Most High. Daniel 7 verse 25, he speaks pompous words against the Most High. The question is, what are those pompous words that this uh, little horn speaks? Revelation 13 verse 5 de defines what those words are. It says in Revelation 13 verse 5 that the beast that comes from the sea was given a mouth that speaks great things and what? Great things and blasphemies. So what does the little horn speak? He speaks blasphemies. What does the beast speak? Blasphemies. Must that mean then that the little horn and the beast claim to have God on earth and claim to have the power to forgive sins and also perform many of God's other functions? Absolutely. But this isn't all. In Daniel chapter 8, we have something very, very interesting. And by the way, before we go to Daniel 8, let me just mention that in Daniel 7, this little horn also thinks that he can perform the works of God. Because it says that the little horn not only speaks blasphemies against God, but he actually thinks that he has power to change God's times and God's what? And God's holy law. In other words, he's not only claiming to be God, he's claiming to exercise the functions and the power of God. Then, of course, we have Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8 speaks also about a little horn. This little horn represents the same as the little horn of Daniel chapter 7. But the interesting thing is that in Daniel chapter 8, this little horn is not mentioned as speaking blasphemies against God. You know what the little horn does in Daniel chapter 8? This is extremely interesting. What the little horn does is he tries to supplant the prince of the host. Do you know who the prince of the host is? The prince of the host is Jesus Christ. You can read, for example, Joshua chapter 5 and verses 13 through 15 where the same expression, prince of the host, is used. And you're going to find that the prince of the host is none other than Jesus Christ. And so in Daniel chapter 8 we're told that, that the little horn was going to try and take away the functions of Jesus defined as the daily. Do you know what the daily is? I wish I had time to, to give a whole lecture on the daily. The daily has to do with the functions that the priest performed in the court and in the holy place. The sacrifice in the court was to be offered morning and evening daily. The lamps in the holy place were to burn daily. The bread was to be there daily. And the incense, which represents the prayers of the saints, was to go up daily or continually. In other words, the little horn was going to take away from Jesus these functions, and he was going to appropriate these functions to himself. He was going to think that he could occupy the place of Jesus Christ. Are you understanding what blasphemy is according to Scripture? There is an abundant amount of testimony in the Bible of what constitutes blasphemy. Now the question is, 
does the Roman Catholic papacy claim, or has it claimed in the past, that the Pope is God on earth? Absolutely. Let me just read you a sampling of statements. I could give you more, but we don't have the time to read them all. This is from the prestigious uh, commentary, Roman Catholic commentary, Lucius Ferraris, Prompta Bibliotheca, uh, in the article Papa or, or Pope. Notice what he has to say. The Pope can modify divine law, since his power is not of man but of God. His power is what? Not of man but of God. And he acts, now notice this, he acts in the place of God upon earth with the fullest power of binding and loosing his sheep. Notice that this Roman Catholic encyclopedia says that the Pope occupies the place of God. Pope Nicholas I, in, who ruled from 858 to 867 AD, had this to say about the power of the Popes. He says, it is evident that the popes can neither be bound nor unbound by any earthly power, nor even by that of the apostle Peter, if he should return upon the earth. Since Constantine the Great has recognized, now listen to this, since Constantine the Great has recognized that the pontiffs held the place of God upon earth, divinity not being able to be judged by any living man. That's blasphemy, folks. It continues saying, we are then, we are then infallible. And whatever may be our acts, we are not accountable for them, but to ourselves. Notice what Pope Leo XIII had to say in an encyclical letter. The name of the encyclical letter was on the chief duties of Christians as citizens. It's dated January 10, 1890. Notice what he said. This is more contemporary. But the supreme teacher in the church is the Roman pontiff. By the way, that's another name for the pope. Union of minds, therefore, requires, together with a perfect accord in one faith, complete submission and obedience to the, of the will to the church and to the Roman pontiff as to God himself. And Leo XIII also said in an encyclical letter dated Jan June 20, 1894, he said unabashedly, we hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. Time and again, you'll find in the writings of Roman Catholics expressions that apply to the Pope calling him Vicar of Christ, Vice Regent of Christ, Representative of Christ, and yes, Vicar of the Son of God. Do you know the, the Popes have claimed throughout the course of history to perform the functions of God? I don't have time to get into all of this. You have these texts on your sheets, but he claims to have the power to forgive sins. He claims to have the power to set up kings and to remove kings. Daniel 2 says that that's God's prerogatives to place kings and to remove kings. He claims to have the prerogative of, be, of being bowed down to. He accepts the title Holy Father. He believes that he can execute the death penalty upon dissenters. He said that he had power to change the, the Sabbath to Sunday. He's felt that it's okay to change God's prophetic calendar. They claim to be God's supreme judges on earth and they also claim to be infallible expositors of God's will in faith and morals. Now folks, all of those things in the Bible are prerogatives of God. If the papacy claims to have had this power, it's because they're usurping the title and they're usurping the power of God. Now let me read you some blasphemous statements from a book by St. Alphonsus Liguori. Uh, he is one of the few doctors of the Roman Catholic Church. There are very few of those. Thomas Aquinas was another, and there's a handful of other ones. But he did a compendium of all of the Roman Catholic wisdom on what the power of the priest is. And uh, I want to read a statement from his book, uh, Dignity and Duties of the Priest or Selva. This is page 58, page uh, 28. He says this, were the Redeemer to descend into a church and sit in a confessional, you know what the confessional is, right? And sit in a confessional 
to administer the sacrament of penance. You know what that means? Those who haven't been Roman Catholics, it means that you go to the confessional, you confess your sin, and the priest says, Ego te absolvo. In other words, I forgive you. So, it's, so it says, were the Redeemer to descend into a church and sit in a confessional to administer the sacrament of penance, and a priest to sit in another confessional, Jesus would say over each penitent, Ego te absolvo, that means I forgive you. The priest would likewise say over each of his penitents, Ego te absolvo, and the penitents of each would be equally absolved. Here's another statement, it gets worse. Listen, when the priest claims to have the power to transform the bread and the wine into the real body and blood of Jesus, notice what St. Alphonsus Ligori says. Thus the priest may in a certain manner be called the creator of his creator. Since by saying the words of consecration he creates, as it were, Jesus in the sacrament by giving him a sacramental existence and produces him as a victim to be offered to the Eternal Father. As in creating the world, it was sufficient for God to have said, let it be made, and it was created. He spoke and they were made, so it is sufficient for the priest to say, hoc est corpus meum, that is, this is my body, and behold, the bread is no longer bread, but the body of Jesus Christ. The power of the priest, now listen to this, the power of the priest, says Saint Bernardine of Siena, is the power of a, the divine person for the transubstantiation of the bread requires as much power as the creation of the world. That's blasphemy according to Scripture. By the way, that's on page, pages 33 and 34 of his book, The Dignity and Duties of the Priest or Selva. Let me read you one more from the same book, page 34. When he ascended into heaven, Jesus Christ left his priests after him to hold on earth his place of mediator between God and men, particularly on the altar. The priest holds the place of the Savior himself, when by saying ego te absolvo, that means I forgive you, he absolves from sin, or he forgives sins. Is that blasphemy according to Scripture? That is absolutely blasphemy. And this system claims to have the power of God and claims to be able to exercise the prerogatives of God. Now you notice when we began this evening that it says that the beast has a blasphemous name. And some people have said, well, you know, uh, that's not saying that he had a blasphemous title, it's saying that he had a blasphemous name, so it must be a proper name. Not so, because in the book of Revelation, name can also refer to a title. And you say, how is that? Go with me to Revelation chapter 19 and verse 16. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 16. This is speaking about Jesus. I just want to show you that the name doesn't have to be a proper name. It doesn't have, to happen, doesn't have to be the name of a specific pope, proper name. It refers to a title. Notice Revelation 19 verse 16. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written. Notice, a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let me ask you, is that a proper name or is that a title? That is a title. So when it says that the beast has a name, the name is not a proper name, it is a title. Now did you notice that the name has a number? You say the name has a number? We didn't read that. Well let's go to Revelation chapter 13 and verse 17. The name is a blasphemous name. Are you, are you clear on that point? The name is a blasphemous name. Now we're going to notice that the name has a number. Revelation 13 and verse 17. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his what? Or the number of his name. So does the, does the blasphemous name of the beast have a number? It most certainly has a number. You say, well, Pastor Bohr, how do you get the number from a name? If this name has a number, which by the way we're going to notice is 666, how do you get a number from a name? Let me explain. In biblical times, they did not have Arabic numerals like we have today. 
The way that they wrote numbers was by using letters of the alphabet. That's true in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. And it's called gematria. That's the method of using n letters of the alphabet as numbers. Let me give you an example. The word for cross in the New Testament is tauros. If you add up the value of the letters in Greek, which because it's a Greek word, the, the value of the word cross is 777. That's interesting. Now if you add up the, word, the, the letters, the number value of the letters in the name Jesus, Jesus, the value is 888. And if you add up the letters in Greek, see we're not cheating, we're not applying uh, you know, uh, Greek to English or Latin to, to Italian, no, we're using the name in the language and the number system of the language. Uh, the, the word paradosis, which means tradition, the number value is 666. Interestingly enough, the word tradition. Now how do we find the numerical value of the name of the beast. Well, allow me to read from a few versions here what we need to do in order to determine the number of his name. I want to read from the Living Bible. I don't normally read from paraphrases, but this paraphrase, paraphrase I believe is very, very faithful to the original text, to the meaning of the original text. Notice what the Living Bible says. On Revelation 13 verse 18 where it speaks about counting the, the name of the beast and the name has a number. It says, this is the translation, here is a puzzle that calls for careful thought to solve it. Let those who are able interpret this code, the numerical values of the letters in his name add to 666. Did you catch that? The numerical value of the letters in his name adds up to 666. Notice the way the New English Bible, which is a, a kind of a dynamic translation of the Bible, the New English Bible says the number represents a man's name. And the numerical value of its letters is 666. Even the Roman Catholic Douay version has a footnote that says this, the, num the numeral letters of his name shall make up this number. So even the Roman Catholic version says what you have to do is find the number value of the letters of his name and then you know what the number of his name is. Now I want you to notice another characteristic that we find of this, uh, of this beast with this number. Notice uh, Revelation chapter 13 and verse 18. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Now let me tell you something about that expression, it is the number of a man. Really, the word uh, number, uh, the, the word man, has the indefinite article a, but it's not in the original language. It can be translated, it is the number of man. In other words, this is a system that is centered in man. By the way, isn't it interesting that many of these antichrist passages have the emphasis upon man. For example, the little horn has eyes like a man. This system has the number of a man. And the one who sits in the temple of God is the man of sin. In other words, this is a system that centers on man, that majors on man. It claims the prerogatives of God, but it brings honor and glory to man. Now we want to ask the question, what language should we, we use to determine the value of the letters of the name? You say, well, how do we know which language to use? Should we use the Greek number system to determine the, the meaning of the name? Should we use the uh, Hebrew system, uh, value of the letters? Should we use the Latin system of the value of the letters? How do you know which number system to use to determine the numerical value of the name? Well, the fact is, there's no doubt whatsoever that we need to use the Latin as the language uh, to determine the number and the name of this beast. And you say, why Latin, Pastor Bohr? Well, for a very simple reason. You remember that there was a dragon in Revelation 12 
that tried to kill the child as soon as the child was born. Let me ask you, what empire was ruling at that time? It was Rome. Then you read Revelation 13 and verse 2, it says that the dragon gave his seat and his power and his authority to whom? To the beast. So let me ask you, where does the beast receive his authority from? He receives it from the dragon, and the dragon represents Satan, but also what? Rome. So in other words, the beast, the little horn, received their power from Rome. By the way, the little horn also comes from the head of the dragon beast, which is Rome. In other words, this power, the little horn, or the beast, are, are from what nation? They are Roman powers, which means that we must use the system of what? The system of numbers that was used in Rome. Now let me ask you, what number system was used in Rome? <laughs> the system that is known as Roman numerals. Now allow me to read a text from the New Testament to prove to you that Latin was spoken in the days of Christ. John chapter 19 and verse 20 tells us that Latin was spoken. Don't you think that I'm just saying, well you know, uh, they spoke Latin way back then. No, I'm not saying that. The Bible says that Latin was the language of Rome back then. Notice John 19 and verse 20. It says, then many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, what else? Greek, and what else? In Latin. So did Latin exist in the times of the Roman Empire? Yes, it was the official language of Rome. Let me ask you, what is the official language of papal Rome? Portuguese? No! The official language of Papal Rome is Latin, which means that his name must be a Latin name because this is a Roman power and we must use Roman numerals to determine the number of his name. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Very, very important. Okay, now let me just digress a moment here because I want to show you that the number 666 is very closely related to Rome. You know, in antiquity, as I was mentioned, in Hebrew, in Greek, and in, in, uh, in Hebrew and in Greek, they used letters to denote numbers. And they did the same thing in Latin, but they changed things around. Whereas in Greek uh, and in um, Hebrew, you know, certain, there were many, many of the letters of the alphabet that were equivalent to numbers. It wasn't so in Latin. In Latin, what they did was choose six Roman numerals to represent all numbers. You say, no pastor, there's seven. There's the I, the V, the X, the L, the C, and the D, right? And the M. You say there's seven, there's not six. But let me tell you that the original system which was developed by the Latin poets did not include the M. The M was added in the Middle Ages. The way that they used to write a thousand was not with an M, I, I have pictures of this, they would write two D's side by side to indicate a thousand. And so the Latin po poets established a system where, where there were six letters of the alphabet that were equivalent to numbers. And you know what's very interesting? If you add the six Roman numerals that were part of the original system, if you add 1 plus 5 plus 10 plus 50 plus 100 plus 500, the total of the Roman numerals is 666. This would seem to indicate they were supposed to look for the number 666 somewhere in Rome. Now a question that comes up is what is the name that this system has that this system applies to its leader which is a blasphemous name. I'm going to tell you what the name is. The name is Vicarious Philly Day. Do you know what that expression means? That name means in Latin Vicarious Philly Day. It means Vicar of the Son of God. See in Latin when you have an ending in I, Philly, and Dei, it's the genitive, it's possessive. So basically it means vicar or representative or one who takes the place of the Son of God. Now some people say, well you know this is just, this name really is not a name that was given to the popes, it's not an official name of the popes, uh, it's just Protestants that say that that was a name of the pope. Well, I want to go through some historical evidence to show you that it's not so. 
For example, in the donation of Constantine, I'm going to go through some history now, and uh, you might not know a lot of this history, but I think it's very, very important. In the donation of Constantine, we find the following words written in this document, which I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about in a few moments. As the blessed Peter is seen to have been constituted vicar of the Son of God, blessed Peter was what? Constituted what? Vicar of the Son of God. By the way, this was written in Latin, and the expression is vicarius fili bei. On the earth, so the pontiffs, who are the representatives of that same chief of the apostles, should obtain from us and our empire the power of a supremacy greater than the clemency, clemency of our earthly imperial serenity is seen to have conceded to it. Let me tell you a few things about the donation of Constantine. It was actually purportedly a letter that was written by Constantine the Great, the emperor, to Pope Sylvester I. And if you read the donation of Constantine, you'll see that Constantine apparently gave temporal power to the Pope. He practically gave the Pope unlimited temporal or political power in the donation of Constantine. Now it's interesting that this document was known as early as the 9th century AD. But beginning with the 11th century AD, it began to be used by the popes in order to prove that they had a right to govern not only in religious affairs, but they had to, uh, the right to govern in political affairs as well, because they used the forgery. They said, Constantine signed this as the emperor, and he told us that we could govern not only in religious affairs, but also in civil affairs. Well, the authenticity of the donation of Constantine was questioned beginning in the 15th century when literary criticism began to grow. Uh, a, a man by the name of Nicholas of Cusa was the first to really say, you know, there's some things in this that show that this doesn't go all the way back to Constantine. This is a forgery from much later. And then a scholar by the name of Laurentius Valla decided that he would do a very meticulous historical study of the donation of Constantine, and he showed beyond any reasonable doubt that this document was a total forgery that was used to try and sustain the temporal claims of the Roman Catholic papacy. By the way, the papacy did not enjoy the work of Laurentius Valla, because in uh, 1559 the Roman Catholic Inquisition put his book on the index of forbidden books. Now some Catholic theologians say, well, you know, this was a forgery. You can't say that because this document used the name Vicarious Philly Day, and it says that this was given to, this title was given to Peter, and it was given to his successors. You can't say that that's an official title of the Roman Catholic papacy when it's a forgery. But the fact is, folks, that this document, even though it was a forgery, was used at least by ten popes and penned off as authentic and authoritative of the Roman Catholic Church. In other words, even though it was a forgery, they said, this is definitely true. And for hundreds of years, they actually used the wording of the donation of Constantine to defend the temporal power of the Roman Catholic papacy. By the way, this title, Vicarious Filii Dei, was incorporated into official Roman Catholic canon law in what is known as Gratian's Decretals, uh, which was published in 1140. And this is an official document of the Roman Catholic Church. It's canon law, it's the laws of the Roman Catholic Church. And that language from the donation of Constantine was incorporated into the Decretals of Gratian, which means that it became official in Roman Catholicism, in other words, it is an official title. By the way, the title is also used by Cardinal Henry Edward Manning in his book, The Temporal Power of the Vicar of Jesus Christ, which he wrote in the year 1862. Uh, actually, at his time, none of the nations of Europe wanted anything to do with the Roman Catholic papacy. And so, uh, Manning wrote his book to scold the nations of Europe because they didn't support the papacy after the French Revolution when the papacy received the deadly wound. And so I'd like to read this statement where he's castigating the nations of Europe for abandoning the papacy. He said this, See this Catholic Church, 
this church of God, feeble and weak, rejected even by the very nations called Catholics. There is Catholic France and Catholic Germany and Catholic Italy giving up this exploded figment of the temporal power of the vicar of Jesus Christ. In other words, they're giving up this concept of, of Jesus Christ, the vicar of Jesus Christ. And so, because the church seems weak, and now notice this, and the vicar of the Son of God, by the way that's vicarious Philly they, the vicar of the Son of God is renewing the passion of his master upon earth, therefore we are scandalized, therefore we turn our faces from him. He's saying we've turned our faces from the vicar of the Son of God, which was the Pope that was ruling in his day. He continues saying in his book, speaking about the growing temporal power of the papacy under the, the uh, popes Gregory the first, Leo the third, Gregory the seventh, and Alexander the third, he says that at this time uh, the power of the pope, the temporal power of the pope became a dogma, a law of conscience, an axiom, axiom of the reason and theological certainty. And then he says this, so that I may say there was never a time when the temporal power of the vicar of the Son of God, there's the same title again, the temporal power of the vicar of the Son of God, though assailed as we see it, was more firmly rooted throughout the whole unity of the Catholic Church and convictions of its members. By the way, the title is also in the prestigious Roman Catholic uh, dictionary or encyclopedia called Prantha Bibliotheca, written or prepared by Lucius Ferraris. I'd like to read you an interesting statement also from the book by John Paul II, Crossing the Threshold of Hope, a very, very popular book. This is what he says uh, on, uh, actually I think it's page 7 of his book, he says this, actually it's page 3. He says, the leader of the Catholic Church is defined by the faith as the vicar of Jesus Christ and is accepted as such by believers. And then John Paul II says this, the Pope is considered the man on earth who represents the Son of God. Is that what a vicar is? Someone who represents someone else? Yes. Who represents the Son of God, and now notice, who what? who takes the place of the second person of the omnipotent God of the Trinity. What is he saying? The Pope what? The Pope occupies the place of Jesus Christ and actually represents Jesus Christ taking his place. By the way, the, one of the greatest patristic scholars, an expert in the writings of the Church Fathers in the Roman Catholic Church was Johannes Quaston. Even today, you know, if you ask a Roman Catholic who the standard was when it comes to the writings of the Church Fathers, the name of Johannes Quaston will come up. And notice what he had to say. The title Vicarious Christi, that's Vicar of Christ, as well as the title Vicarious Philly Day is very common as the title of what? As the title of the Pope. Now, for some time, Adventists, uh, we're saying that this title, Vicarius Filidei, was on the papal uh, tiara or on the papal mitre. But people today, they look on, at the mitre and they look at the tiara and they say, uh, the name Vicarius Filidei isn't on there. And so the Roman Catholic Church has said it was never on there. Now I want to share a statement from the Great Controversy, page 61 where Ellen White explains what happened to several of the records that were kept during the period of the Middle Ages. Actually, they were not preserved, they were destroyed. Notice what she says. Rome endeavored also to destroy every record of her cruelty toward dissenters. Papal councils decreed that books and writings containing such records should be committed to the flames. Before the invention of printing, Books were few in number and in a form not favorable for preservation. Therefore, there was little to prevent the Romanists from carrying out their purpose. Now I want to read you a couple of statements from our Sunday visitor 
It is uh, actually a very important publication. It's the main publication of the Archdiocese of Baltimore, or at least it was. In the edition of November 15, 1914, and by the way, I have copies of both of these that I'm going to read now, so this is something that, that I have in my possession, in my files. Uh, the question was asked November 15, 1914, uh, and this is the question. Is it true that the words of the Apocalypse in the 13th chapter, 18th verse, refer to the Pope? Now here's the answer that's given in this Roman Catholic publication. The words referred to are these. Here is wisdom. He that hath understanding, let him count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and the number of him is 666. Now notice this, the title of the Pope in Rome is Vicarious Philly Day. This is an official Roman Catholic, Catholic publication. This is inscribed on his mitre. And if you take the letters of his title, which represent Latin numerals, and add them together, they come to 666. In another edition of our Sunday Visitor, April 18, 1915, another question was asked. Here it is. What are the letters supposed to be in the Pope's crown? And what do they signify, if anything? Here's the answer that's given in this publication. The letters inscribed in the Pope's mitre are these. Vicarius Fili Dei. This is not some Protestant saying this. The letters inscribed in the Pope's mitre are these, Vicarius Philidae, which is the Latin for the vicar of the Son of God. Vicar means he who represents, he who occupies the place, as was defined by John Paul II. Continue saying, Catholics hold that the church, which is a visible society, must have a visible head. Christ, before his ascension into heaven, appointed Saint Peter to act as his representative. Upon the death of Peter, the man who succeeded to the office of Peter as Bishop of Rome was recognized as the head of the church. Hence, to the Bishop of Rome, as the head of the church, was given the title Vicar of Christ. Now the interesting thing is that a Roman Catholic apologist by the name of Patrick Madrid contacted Robert Lockwood, who was the editor of Our Sunday Visitor, and said that he wanted to take a look at the 1915 issue of Our Sunday Visitor. And when he contacted Robert Lockwood, he said, I'm sorry, but that particular issue is not available. It has been expunged from the archives. Now let me tell you folks, if they expunge an incriminating article like that, a whole issue, not an article, but a whole issue of Our Sunday Visitor from the archives, would it just be very possible to delete or take away the title Vicarious Philly Day from the tiara or from the mitre of the Pope's crown? Absolutely. By the way, there are witnesses from the past who testify that they saw the papal tiara or the mitre with the name Vicarious Philly Day. Now it's true that September 16, 1917, and this article was repeated on August 3, 1941 of our Sunday Visitor, uh, the Roman Catholic Church disowned what they had said in the first two issues. This is what they said. The words vicarious Philly Day are not the name of the Pope. They do not even constitute his official title. Now we've already noticed historically that it is his official title and it's officially incorporated and used in the donation of Constantine in Gratian's Decretals. It's also used by Pope John Paul II. It's used by Cardinal Henry Edward Manning. It's used in different sources as an official title and of course Johannes Quaston, the renowned uh, patristic scholar of the Roman Catholic Church says that it is an official title. So let me ask you, which issue of our Sunday Visitor should we believe? Now there are many people these days who uh, choose different names to apply uh, to the number 666. For example, they say uh, Dux Clary, which means the head of the clerg clergy, uh, comes out to 666. Another word, Lateinus, which means Latin man, also comes out to 666. Another name, Ludovicus, 
means chief of the court of Rome if you add up the, the uh, letters in Roman numerals it also comes out to 666. Actually the name of John Paul II in Latin Ioannis Paulus II also comes out to 666. And so they try and find the number 666 in all of these names. But let me tell you the problem that I have with all of these names. None of these names are particularly blasphemous. Is it blasphemous to, to speak of the, he the head of the clergy? No. Is it blasphemous to, to speak of um, the chief of the court of Rome? No. Is the name Ioannis Paulus II particularly blasphemous, his proper name? Absolutely not. Is the, the word Lateinos, which means Latin man, is that particularly blasphemous? No. The name which gives a number must be what kind of a name? It must be a blasphemous name, a name that apparently gives him the right to claim the prerogatives of God and to claim the power of God. By the way, do you know who Jesus left on this earth as his representative when he left? <laughs> it was not the Pope. It was the Holy Spirit. Notice what we find in John chapter 14 verses 16 through 18. Here Jesus is speaking. And I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he dwells with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will what? I will come to you. So who did Jesus send as his representative on earth? The Holy Spirit. Now look how, how, how interesting this is. Jesus said, I'm going to be the visible head and I'm going to be in heaven. The Holy Spirit is going to be the invisible head and he's going to be on earth. The Roman Catholic Church has changed that around. And they say the invisible head of the church is in heaven, Jesus Christ, and the visible head of the church is the Pope on earth. In this way the Pope has usurped not only the position of Jesus Christ, but has usurped the position of the Holy Spirit. If that isn't the epitome of blasphemy, I don't know what is. By the way, did you know that the word antichrist is almost synonymous to the expression biker of the Son of God, vicarius filidei? You say, now wait a minute, Pastor. Antichrist means somebody, somebody who is against Christ or who is opposed to Christ. That's possible. But do you know that the Greek preposition anti also means to take the place of or to substitute for someone. Let me give you some examples. In Greek the word antibasileus means one who takes the place of the king when the king leaves. You're acquainted with the name Antipas, right? Antipas. Antipas it actually means one who ruled in place of his father. He didn't rule against his father. He ruled in place of his father. We have the word anti-type. Do you know what the word anti-type means? It means that which takes the place of the type. See, when the, when the anti-type comes, you don't need the type anymore because the type is fulfilled. So in other words, anti-type means that which takes the place of the type. So the question is, what is meant then by the word antichrist? The word antichrist does not mean merely against Christ. It means one who seeks to occupy the place of Christ. Just like John Paul II said in his book, The Threshold of Hope. I'd like to finish by reading a statement from the book of Dave Hunt, Global Peace. Now I disagree with Dave Hunt almost on everything that he writes. In fact, I disagree with his identity of the Antichrist here. He says that this Antichrist is going to be a nasty individual who's going to rise in the Middle East when the temple is rebuilt after the church has been raptured to heaven. No, I don't believe any of that. I believe the Antichrist arose in the Middle Ages and he ruled for a long period of time. It wasn't one person, it was a succession of individuals. But I believe that the portrait that Dave Hunt gives of the Antichrist is accurate and it applies to a T to the Roman Catholic Papacy. Notice what he says. This is pages 6 through 8 of his book Global Peace. He says, while the Greek prefix anti 
generally means against or opposed to, it can also mean in the place of or a substitute for. The Antichrist will embody both meanings. He will oppose Christ while pretending to be Christ. Instead of a frontal assault against Christianity, the evil one will pervert the church from within by posing as its founder. He will cunningly misrepresent Christ while pretending to be Christ. And by that process of substitution, notice the word substitution, by that process of substitution he will undermine and pervert all that Christ truly is. And now notice what he says, if the Antichrist will indeed pretend to be the Christ, then his followers must be Christians. The church of that day will without dissenting voice hail him as its leader. Do you understand a little bit better now what the number of the beast is? The number of the beast is 666. But that number is the number of his what? Of his blasphemous name, which is vicarious Philly Day, where he claims to occupy the position of God on earth, to occupy the position of Jesus Christ on earth and to exercise the powers and prerogatives of Jesus, of forgiving sins, of interceding for sinners, of placing kings and deposing kings, of speaking infallibly in faith and morals, and receiving, uh, you know, people bowing down to him and calling him Holy Father. When Jesus said, no one on this earth should be called Father, for one is your Father, your God who is in heaven. Folks, all of these characteristics clearly show what this power is. And God has given us all of this so that we can escape from His power in these last days. 